Hi, I am Dennis Gieser and welcome to my talk about robots with lasers and cameras, but no security, where we will talk about ways how you can liberate your vacuum from the cloud. Before we start, here are some background information about me. I'm a PhD student at Northeast University and I'm working with Professor Givarno Beer. Our research field is wireless and embedded security. My particular interest is in the, in the reverse engineering of interesting devices. I focus on smart home devices, mostly vacuum cleaning robots. My current research is in the security and privacy of smart home speakers. In our most recent work, we analyzed the security and privacy of used Amazon Echo devices. This paper was published on ACM Wysec this year. Let's talk about the goals of this talk. First, I would like to give you an overview over the current development and routing of vacuum cleaning robots. In particular, we will focus on Roborock and Dreamy. We will talk about vulnerabilities and backdoors. And I will explain new methods which you can use to root your device. As a general side note, uh, I have no intention of bashing the companies. I like the products and I think we maintain a very friendly relationship. However, obviously our goals are uh, slightly different. All right, let's talk about our motivation. So why do we want to root devices? Well, as devices have powerful hardware and a lot of sensors, we can play around with interesting hardware. This is especially interesting for people in education. Then we want to stop devices from constantly phoning home. Also, a lot of people have already custom smart home services running, for example, Home Assistant. And uh, here it is interesting to connect uh, the vacuum cleaners um, to that system. And finally, we want to verify the privacy claims of, um, of the manufacturers. Um, so why don't we trust IoT? Well, IoT in general, they're always connected to the internet and they're in your home network. The cloud communication is encrypted and you don't really know what kind of data is transmitted. From our experience, we know that developing secure hardware and software is hard and that IoT devices are not always being patched. Also, vendors sometimes contradict each other um, in regard of their privacy claims. And as an end user, you have no way to be sure. All right, here's an example. Roborock claims for the flagship model that nothing is sent to the cloud, especially what is recorded um, by the camera. This claim was also certified by the German TÜV. However, on the same website, they show that you can access the camera remotely from your phone. For example, you can watch your pads and talk to them. Let's talk about the problem of used devices. A lot of people order devices on Amazon, try them and return them. So used devices are not that rare. As a buyer, you have no real information about the path of the device. So a malicious person could have installed a rootkit onto it. As a new owner, you have no way to verify the software and as a result, you might have a malicious device in your home network. So routing is the only way for you to verify that the device is in fact clean. All right, let's take a look into the past, uh, the good old times of routing. My first work with vacuum cleaning robots was back in 2017. Here I worked with Daniel Wegema and we were looking at the Xiaomi vacuum cleaning robot and the Roborock S5. Um, the, we figured out that the firmware images of these devices were unsigned and encrypted with a very weak key and that custom firmware could be pushed from the local network. As a result, it was possible to route the devices without disassembly and develop custom software and voice packages for them. We published our findings on the 34C3 and back in 2017 and also on DEF CON uh, exactly three years ago. Uh, here I would like to give you some short recap about the hardware of the Xiaomi vacuum robot and the S5. Um, both robots were running an ARM quad-core CPU and have 512 megabyte of RAM. They had also four gigabyte of EMMC flash. Um, they had a lot of sensors and in particular, the most important ones are the LiDAR sensor on the top of the robot, the infrared sensor and the ultrasonic sensor. This device had also some debug ports, for example, USB and UART. However, uh, USB was kind of protected and we never used it for anything. To give you some uh, background information about the software, this device is run of Ubuntu 14.04, mostly untouched. However, the vendor is obfuscated the root password. 
Um, interestingly, the vacuum cleaners were controlled by the player software, which is basically an open source robot device interface and server. So they used open source software to run the devices. They had a lot of proprietary software on them. For example, they used a custom ADB version, um, which had some authentication, and um, so we couldn't really use it. Um, we ran a custom watchdog, which um, made sure that the device didn't crash, but on the other side also enforced copy protection. And they had a logging tool, which uploaded a lot of data to the cloud. Um, they protected the ports on, on the device uh, with IP tables. Uh, for example, they blocked the port 22 for SSH and blocked also the player ports. However, the interesting thing was that the IP tables rules only apply to IPv4. So if the device got an IPv6 address, um, it would not firewall at all. All right, let's look on how the forces dragged back and how they started to lock down the devices. Well, the first steps in locking down we saw with newer S5 firmware. So here, um, Roborock did block local firmware updates. Um, interestingly, uh, this change was also pushed through other IoT devices from Xiaomi. So most devices were basically um, blocking local firmware updates. We saw more changes with the introduction of the Roborock S6, which came out in 2019. For example, the firmware and the voice packages were now signed, so we were not able to create our own custom voice packages anymore. Each model also used different encryption keys, so if we had encryption keys for one model, we were not able to decrypt firmware for a different model. They also started to sign the configuration files to enforce region locks, as many people bought cheap devices from China and modified them so that we were able to use them outside of mainland China. Um, one interesting aspect is that most of the hardware um, remained mostly the same, so most of the changes were basically just done in software. All these changes meant that in order to get root access onto the device, um, we need to disassemble it. One thing which we thought back then when this device came out, that we might need to keep rooting methods secret. And um, so in the first two weeks when I got the Roborock S6, I was able to root it. And I developed two different methods. One where we extracted the root password via UART and deobfuscated it so I could get access to over serial, for example. And the other way was that um, I booted into a single user mode and modified files there so that I had SSH access. Um, back then, I didn't publish the methods for some time as I assumed that Roborock would lock them down as soon as they know about them. So this is what you had to do to get root access. You had basically to solder wires to the test pads uh, to get the UART port. Um, with routing, we made some observations over time. Every time we published a method, it got blocked. And here are some examples for blocking. For example, local updates, which we published in 2017, were blocked in firmware updates 2018. The root password method, which I published in 2019, was blocked in newly produced devices back in 2019. And the UBIT bypass was fixed uh, for new models in 2020. So um, there was one model which came out at this time and it was already patched. Um, this, this means basically that all current public methods are basically blocked. All right, let's talk about the development of Roborock models over time. So uh, we, we only will talk about global models. So uh, there are way more models like in mainland China, but in this case, um, I just wanna talk about global models. Um, on the left side, you see the size of the RAM. On the right side, you see the size of the flash. And this becomes more important later. Uh, in 2016, Xiaomi released the uh, V1, which was um, basically a OM product by Roborock. Roborock released um, the S5 under their own name in 2017. Uh, in 2019, we saw more devices. We saw the Roborock S6 and uh, S6 Pure and the Xiaomi M1S, which was again an um, OM product. In 2020, we saw the S4, S4 Max, and S5 Max, and their flagship model, the S6 Max V. And this year, we saw the Roborock S7. If you add the price, then you see that higher prices do not really correlate with better hardware. Also, one thing which we noticed is that manufacturers are recycling hardware in different models. For example, the Xiaomi vacuum robot has more or less the same hardware as the Roborock S4. The Roborock S5 and the Roborock S6 are more or less the same. And as you can see on the bottom, the S6 Pure, the S4 Max, the S5 Max, and the S7 have the same mainboard and more or less the same hardware too. However, the prices are very different for them. Um, as a conclusion, one thing which we notice is that the hardware gets weaker over time despite the devices getting more expensive. 
Roborock has two vacuum cleaners which are special. Both of them contain a camera, which is a little bit more critical in regard to privacy. Um, the first one is the M1S, which was released in 2019. Instead of using an all winner chip, this one uses a rock chip quad core. It has 505 megabyte of RAM, 4 gigabyte of EMMC. It has a LiDAR sensor, which we already know from other models. But in addition to that, it has also an upward facing black and white camera. Um, it does have an ultrasonic distance sensor in the front and infrared sensors. To give you a perspective of the camera, I record this video on a rooted vacuum cleaner um, and I used GStreamer for that. The second model with a camera is the Roborock S6 Max V. This is currently the flagship model. It was released in 2020 and contains a Qualcomm Octa Core SoC. It has 1 gigabyte of RAM, 4 gigabyte of EMMC flash. In addition to the LiDAR, it has also two color cameras in the front, which are illuminated with infrared. And it has the usual infrared sensors. In the bottom left, you can see the stereo camera of this device. In the bottom, it has the infrared illumination. So this device will see in the dark. On the right, you find screenshots from the app. As you can see, the vacuum cleaner can actually detect objects and can avoid them. This is also quite interesting, again, for privacy reasons. If you look at the software of both devices, both of them are very similar. Um, they use Android as the operation system, and the controlling software for the robot is very similar to the previous models. The software access the cameras via the Video for Linux subsystem. There are a lot of libraries which are used, but the more interesting ones are OpenCV, OpenCL, and the TensorFlow Lite. Roborock learned from the past and added a lot of security measures to their device. For example, Secure Boot is enabled and they make use of the replay protected memory block as a downgrade protection. The system partition is integrity protected with DM Verity, so we cannot modify it. Also, a lot of partitions are encrypted with looks. In particular, all the application specific programs are stored on an encrypted partition. The keys for this partition are stored in OPT, which is using ARM Trust Zone but there are more security features. For example, Roborock added a kernel-based verification of binaries. All binaries before we get executed are checked for, a, for the correct signature. This means we cannot really put any custom binaries onto the system. Also, we signed and encrypted the firmware updates. This time, each of the firmware versions has a different key. The master keys itself are stored in OPT and put us using Trustor. And interestingly, they modified the IP tables binary. Traditionally, what we did for routing, we removed all the firewall routes as soon as we root the device so we could access SSH and other tools. However, Roborock removed the ability of IP tables to flush or delete routes. So as, as soon as routes are added to IP tables, we cannot remove them anymore. And they locked also UART, so we cannot use UART to get um, root, root access. All right. We had some partitions uh, which are especially interesting on, on these devices, which we need also later for, for, for our route. There's the app partition, which contains the device credentials and some other configuration files. This partition is not protected by loops or DM Verity. Then we have two copies of the system partition. One of them is the active one, one of them is the passive one. Both partitions are protected with DM Verity, so we cannot modify them. Then we have two application partitions, again, one active and one passive copy, which are encrypted with looks. However, they are not integrity protected. We have a reserve partition, which contains the calibration data. This one is, again, encrypted. And we have the user data partition, which contains log files and the maps, and it's, again, encrypted with looks. So let's talk about the new routing methods for Roborock. Currently, there are three models of vacuum cleaners which have no public route. This is the Roborock S7, which came out this year, the M1S, and the Max-V. Let's start with the Roborock. So the Roborock S7 has more or less the same mainboard as the S5 Max, S6 Pure, etc. However, the problem is that they patched U-Boot, so we cannot use u anymore to root it. In addition to that, the rootFS is a read-only squashFS, so um, even if we have access on a device, we cannot modify the partition. I developed a new method for this device, um, which is FEL routing. This method doesn't require any soldering, however, it requires still that the device is disassembled. This method also automatically patches the rootFS and enables SSH. And it applies to all current NAND-based Roborock models. In order to find a new routing method, we need to reverse engineer the PCB. 
We knew already where the UART pins were, but they are useless after they blocked this functionality. However, all the overness socks have, have the so-called FEL mode. FEL mode is a low-level mode which allows the flashing of the device, and it is burned in the SOC ROM, so it cannot be modified. The idea is to load a custom OS via FEL. There are two typical methods to trigger the FEL mode. First, we can somehow disable the flash chip, for example, by grounding the clock. However, this method might be risky if you don't do it correctly. And the second one is that we can pull the boot mode uh, pin or trigger the FEL pin. Um, the problem with this is we need to figure out where this pin is. So I got myself a spare PCB and did destructively disorder the SOC chip. After I did that, I probed all the pins and was able to find an interesting pin, for example, like JTAG or the boot, boot mode selection. And by having this, we can use it to trigger the FEL mode. So how does this approach actually work? The challenge for all Windows socks is that the NAND support is proprietary. So we cannot use a mainline kernel or mainline U-boot. So my approach was the following. I extracted the kernel configuration from the Roborock kernel. I created my own init RAMFS with Dropier, SSH keys, and some tools. I compiled a minimal kernel using the Nintendo NES classic sources. The Nintendo NES Classic used the same chip as the Roborock vacuums. I created my custom U-boot version and with, with an extracted Roborock configuration, and I triggered the FEL mode by porting the TPS-17, this is the boot selection pin, to ground. Um, then I loaded the U-boot kernel and the init RAMFS into the RAM and executed it. Um, after I did that, um, my custom OS booted, patched automatically the rootFS, and I had root. How does the patching process exactly look like? First, we need to boot into the FEL image. Then we need to just decompress the squash FS. After that, we patch this, this image. For example, we install the authorized key file and the custom Dropier server. We compress the image again and overwrite the partition with the new image. And as a result, we have SSH access and root. So what are the advantages of this new method? Well, first, we don't need any soldering anymore. We just can short the boot pin one time and uh, we're good to go. It's a very simple process, and it also allows to restore brick devices, which was not possible before. And also one important thing is that it can be used for all our winner-based vacuum cleaners. So now that we have root for the Roborock S7, let's take a look at the camera-based models. So if you want to root the M1S and the Max V, we have some, some issues. First, all the ports are closed or firewalled. The file systems are encrypted or integrity protected and the USB interface is also protected with some custom ADBD. So to get root access, we need to have a layered approach. First, we need to break in via USB. Then we need to disable this e-Linux and then patch the application partition. And as an important note, while it might be possible to root these devices, it might be impossible for many people. So um, don't expect it to be that easy as for previous models. All right, level one get ADB shell. If we connect over USB, we need to do a challenge response authentication. Um, this authentication is based on a Windows secret, um, which we don't have. So Roborock has it properly somewhere in a database. Um, the secret is also device specific. Also, the ADB is controlled over a special configuration file, which we might need to modify. All the files are stored under default position and are thankfully not protected. So our idea is the follows. First, we need to connect to the flash, for example, via in-system programming or by disordering it. Then we need to create or extract the window secret. And then we use a tool to compute the challenge response. So for the M1S, we can do in-system programming by soldering small wires on the bottom side of the PCB. Um, the pictures which you see here are from my experiments where I used the SD card as a replacement for the, for the EMMC flash but the pinout is more or less the same. As an important warning, if you don't know what you're doing, you likely will break your device. So I tried both methods, but I figured out ISP is, can be sometimes tricky. So what I did instead is I used an adapter to, to read out the chip, which requires reflow soldering to remove the chip and reboiling and then resoldering it again. Okay, what are the results of level one? Um, I have a more detailed um, how-to on my website. However, what I did here is I set the window secret to all use. After I connected the device via USB, I needed to extract the serial number from it. 
So I ran ADB devices. The serial number is required for the challenge response process. In the next step, I asked the device for a challenge. So as you see here, I got like a random string back, which is the challenge. In the next step, I used the tool Vinda to generate a response. Um, so at this point, I want to thank Eric Bullman for his support and help um, to create this tool. Uh, before that, I was computing the um, the response manually, but uh, he extracted with in Ghidra the uh, function and just put it in a C program. So now we can just run it from the shell. Um, the result of this um, of this program is basically the response. And as soon as we have that, we can just uh, run any commands which we want to do, as you see here. We have no shell access, but at Linux is still enforced. As a Linux will prevent us from doing specific things, even if we are root. For example, the network access is blocked and we don't have any access to the dev directory, so we cannot mount partitions or access devices. However, we can do two things. We can do bind mounts and we can issue the kill command. So the idea to disable as a Linux is as follows. Uh, first, we copy the Mio directory to a temporary location. The Mio directory contains the Xiaomi cloud client, which is launched by the watchdog. The watchdog has all privileges, and it makes sure that if the Mio client is crashing, that it gets restarted. In the next step, we replace the Mio client with a bash script, which disables as a Linux. In the next step, we mount this temporary location back to the original location. If we now kill the Mio client, the watchdog will restart our bash script instead of the real Mio client. So hopefully as a Linux gets disabled. Let's take a look if this works also in practice. In this case, what we need to verify first that is a Linux is actually enabled. So with the get enforce command, we, we get a uh, response that it's enforcing. In the next step, we check the process ID of the Mio client process. So we see the original process is running. Now we copy the Mio folder to a temporary location and write our bash script into the client. The client is not an alpha anymore, instead it's a bash script. Now we bind mount this folder to the original location and we kill the Mio client. And now hopefully the bash script is executed and we can check it with get enforce and we see it's permissive, so now as Linux is disabled. Let's do level three. We have now full root access, however, it's only temporarily. So as in, in the moment when we restart a vacuum cleaner, we lose root access. So the good thing is the app partition is not integrity protected. If we modify information there, then we don't have any issue. By modification of a few scripts, we can disable as Linux and start Dropier on a different port. Uh, the reason why we want to start Dropier on a different port is that uh, IP tables still blocks the port 22. As I mentioned before, Ruborock modified the IP tables binary so that we cannot delete routes, but instead we can just use a different port. We are still limited by the ELF binary signature verification. However, we found a backdoor in this function. If you give a binary a particular name, then it is whitelisted. We can even point symbolic links to this binary. Um, many thanks again to Eric Ullman at this point, uh, which helped me to figure that out. Let's do the demo again. I want to run Valetudo on my robot. Valetudo is a cloud replacement which allows to control your vacuum robot locally. As you can see here, I downloaded it with VGET into a temporary directory and I tried to launch it. However, I got a segmentation fault. Typically, segmentation faults happen if some libraries are broken. However, when I was looking at the kernel log, I saw that the verify L function kicked in and stopped the execution. So now let's try a trick with the whitelist. So we renamed the Valetudo binary to the uh, whitelisted name. As soon as we run the whitelisted name, you see Valetudo is starting happily and everything works. So now we have full root access and can run our own binaries on the system. So some other ideas for this vacuum cleaners. Well, we can ask Opti nicely to decrypt firmware updates for us. As we have root access and as we um, have still a secure system, um, Opti will happily decrypt firmware updates for us. Also, we can access the cameras directly. For people who understand how TensorFlow Lite works, you can take a look at the machine learning models of the vacuum cleaner. I myself have no idea how this works, so I didn't take a look at it. And uh, we can take also a look at the error backdoors. So there are some hidden functions which wait only to be explored. 
So as a summary about Roborock, well, we have an easy method to route the S7 vacuum cleaner and some other models. Um, we have also a routing method to route the M1S and MAXV. However, this method is dangerous and will likely break your device. It's mostly only feasible if you have the equipment and experience. So regard this route as a proof of concept and that we technically can route these devices. However, I don't think that it will be um, useful for a lot of people. As a general recommendation, I think at this point, um, I would say that we should try to avoid uh, new Roborock models uh, if you want to have root. Um, part of the reason is that they lock down the systems, and the other reason is that due to the weaker hardware, we will run into resource re uh, issues uh, if you try to run custom software onto them. All right, so we need a new alternative, and the great thing is there's a new player in the field of vacuum cleaners, which is Dreamy. Um, Dreamy is the great alternative for us. Uh, they released their first model in, back in 2019, and they produce OM products also for Xiaomi. They have four different kinds of uh, vacuum cleaners which we produce. Um, the Xiaomi 1C and the Dreamy F9 are VSLAM-based models, so they have a camera which is looking um, on the ceiling, and they create a map via that. The Dreamy D9 has a more traditional LiDAR sensor, similar to the Roborock devices. Um, the Xiaomi 1T has a VSLAM and time of flight camera, so it can scan, it can pre scan uh, objects which are in front of it. And the current flagship model is the Dreamy L10 Pro, which has LiDAR, a line laser, and a camera. All of these devices are based on various all winner socks. Dreamy uses for their devices a custom Android, which is mostly based on the Tina Linux, which is provided by Allwinner. Um, the company developed their own robotic software, which is Ava. So let's take a quick look on what kind of sensors you can access on these devices. These pictures were recorded on rooted vacuum cleaners. Um, as you can see here, there's a, a camera which is looking onto the ceiling. And if you root your devices, you're able to access these cameras. The Xiaomi 1T has an additional camera in the front, which is a time of flight camera. With that, you get a point plot of objects which are in front of the vacuum cleaner. The Dreamy L10 Pro uses line lasers to uh, detect objects in front of it. As you can see on the right, the, the device creates two laser beams, and if there's any object in front of the device, it, the laser beam gets distorted. Um, the camera will pick up this distortion and will determine how far away the, the object is. So let's talk about how we can root Dreamy. The routing of the device is surprisingly easy. So um, I bought my, my first Dreamy robot when I was in China back in 2019. And it took me only a couple of days to, to root the device. The good thing is that all the devices have, have the same debug connector, which can be accessed without breaking any warranty seals. I did do a lot of reverse engineering, and I was able to extract the key material and firmware. Also, I reverse engineered ways to create proper FEL images. So with the help of the Banana Pi tools, which are also based on all winners socks, I was able to create images which you can use to flatten the devices. Um, to flatten the device, you need unfortunately to use a Windows-only software, which is Phoenix USB. There might be also ways to flash it over Linux, but I didn't um, investigate that. So how does this debug interface look like? The debug interface has two times eight pins, and it has a pitch set of two millimeter. The two millimeters are way smaller than the typical jumper wires which you get. Um, if you plan to connect it with wires, um, then make sure that you connect to the right pins. The debug interface gives us a couple of, in uh, of interesting interfaces. For example, we have USB, we have UART, and we have the boot selection pin. Um, I saw that there's also like another UART there and likely JTAG, but I didn't investigate further. To easily root a device, we created custom PCBs which enable you to easily access the USB and UART. Um, there's a simple version which has, gives you a USB and gives you the UART uh, headers, and there's an advanced version which has an onboard serial controller. I want to thank at this point Ben Helfrich who created the boards and KiCat, and um, at the bottom of the slides, you find a link to the Gerber files. Here are some examples how you can connect them. For example, for the PCB, you can insert it, and uh, you just have to make sure that you have the right orientation, that you don't fry the board, and uh, you can just connect USB and UART. If you don't have this board, 
Um, you can also use jumper virus, but you need to be a little bit more careful and uh, make sure that uh, the connection is properly done. On the bottom, there's a diagram how you need to connect everything. Uh, let's talk about some interesting findings which I which I saw um, when I reverse engineered the Dreamy firmware. So all the devices have an auto SSH backdoor. This can be triggered from the cloud. What this will do is it will create a reverse SSH shell to one of Dreamy servers. The interesting thing here is that they hard coded the credentials to the server, which is public facing. The bigger problem is that this user, which is used to create this reverse SSH, has sudo rights on that server. And it appears that the server is used for development. I don't really know why we did that, but this seems like a really, really bad idea. A scary thing which I found were the startup debug scripts. These scripts were downloaded over FTP from some personal developers NAS. Um, these scripts are also executed at boot up for some devices. The same debug scripts are also uploading log files onto that NAS, and um, the admin credentials are in plain text in that script. All of the um, vacuum cleaners have uh, predictable root passwords. For example, devices with production firmware, you can compute the root password from the serial number. For devices with debug firmware, there's only one valid password. So um, knowing that, it might be a bad idea to connect your vacuum cleaner directly to the internet. I found also a lot of chatty functions. The um, Cloud API allows um, the execution of some debug functions. For example, um, someone can trigger the recording and uploads of pictures or the recording and uploads of camera records for devices with cameras. And the device also produces a lot of log files. The only way to prevent these uploads is basically routing. I don't know if these functions are used on a regular basis by the developers, but um, the fact that these functions exist uh, is kind of scary. As a summary about Dreamy, the devices are cheaper than Roborock, and they have also performant hardware. This makes the devices the perfect target for routing. As I'm working on the routing for quite quite a time already, um, I was able to work with uh, the developer of Valetudo on the support on the devices. So I'm happy to announce that all Dreamy devices so far are fully supported by Valetudo since April 2021. Um, all current models can be routed without any soldering, and this also applies to all devices released before August uh, 2021. There will be some devices in the future. We don't know yet if they are routable or not, but um, we will figure out very soon. The Dust Builder is a website to build your own custom robot firmware. Um, you can create reproducible builds, it's easy to use, especially for Windows users. In the past, we had a lot of trouble with uh, Windows and Mac users where building firmwares were kind of tricky. Um, so this tool kind of uh, makes it way easier. Um, the Dust Builder works for Dreamy, Roborock, and Viomi devices, and is a perfect alternative to local building. However, if you don't trust it, the tools will be still published on GitHub. Um, you find the Dust Builder under builder.dontvacuum.me. At the end, I want to thank a few people um, which supported me in doing this presentation and doing the research. I want to thank Ben Helfrich, Caroline Gross, C Cameron Kennedy, Danny Wigema, Eric Ullmann, Guevara Nobir, and Zoe Bayo. If you have any questions, feel free to con contact me via email, Telegram, or Twitter. Visit my website for any additional information, or meet me here at DEF CON if you're around. If you happen to have a Dreamy robot or plan to get a Dreamy robot, I have a couple of spare PCBs with me which you can pick up for free. Thank you very much and have a nice con.